the energy of abundance practical advice and spiritual wisdom to achieve anything in life chapter 10 parenting richard evans said a person soon learns how little he knows when a child begins to ask questions there are a few topics that inspire potent feelings and the way parenting can the only other topic that comes close to mind is when the Democrats and Republicans in the United States go at each other, because that's a flat out bloodbath. But parents lose all rational thought processes when it comes to their children, no matter how hard we try, it's, it's practically impossible not to lose rational thought. You know, and I'm a parent, I have two children, and I know all about mother bear feelings. And it has truly been one of the last terrains I have been trying to master in my life in terms of trust and surrender. Because truly, I can be very Zen in every area of my life for the most part. However, the feelings of protection and defense that arise as a parent when my children are in various situations can throw me off balance in a second. Children inspire so much in us because they give us unconditional love. Many of us have rarely or sometimes never experienced unconditional love. And when we become parents, we see the promise and feel what that's like. We want to give our children what we didn't have. Some of us learn for the first time what love really is and that it has nothing to do with what we get. As parents, we become extraordinarily invested in how our children develop, that's our job. But this includes how they're treated outside of our home to ensure we set up their lives for greater success than what we had. So, but in this process, our emotional identifications can really come into play and take us out of balance. When I say emotional identifications, I mean when we allow ourselves to overprotect, when we become over emotional and become full of fear that something bad will happen to our children if we do not intervene. We forget that our children also have a life path to live, that they are also divinely guided, loved, and protected just as we are that they also chose a life experience. So this ability to stop ourselves from clamping down and going into fear with every interaction is what parents often have to master. Now, on the other side of this topic are people who invest all their energy to a child, essentially to live vicariously through their child. They insist the child do and accomplish things they didn't or invest in projects and ideas that they think are right for the child, even if they aren't. They simply project their own ideas about what the child should do or become. And this actually creates karma. The parent is trying to make up for what they lost in their own life. And those projections are more harmful than many things. Last week, I was at a Little League baseball tryout for my nine-year-old son. And FYI, at the time of recording this book, my son is now 16. And these Little League tryouts aren't really tryouts. It's, it's more of balancing the team so that all the best players aren't on one team and all the average or lesser players are on another. So while the boys are warming up, I watched um, one of the parents throwing balls to their son, really trying to be encouraging, myself included, I wanted my son to feel confident when his time came. Right next to me was a dad throwing balls to his son, and he was extremely serious. He had his face very close to his son's face, speaking low, intently, and carefully. The boy was clearly getting frustrated with his dad for putting so much pressure on him and requiring him to follow his instructions so intently. Neither one of them was having much fun. So I watched that interaction and felt somewhat sad for both of them. Here they were on a Saturday morning with an opportunity to share an experience together and bond more closely together. And the dad was making the experience about achievement as if he's auditioning for the MLB 
rather than having fun and developing a new skill set. So looking at the energy of this, it's an example of how people contract frequencies when they're actually trying to expand frequencies. And so it has the opposite impact. We get in the way of abundance and the divine infusing possibility into the experience. So when we're feeling sad and frustrated, it's all the more difficult to feel powerful and confident. So the dad practicing baseball with his son, you know, really loves his son. He wants his son to do well so he can feel good about himself and have good experiences and be respected by his peers. But when he imposes language and behavior that force his son to respond and act in the way he wants him to, he precludes his son from claiming his own abundance. The son has to figure out his way to garner respect and confidence. That's his journey. And his dad was creating the opposite impact. As parents, we have to trust that the same divine consciousness that works in our lives is also working in our children's lives. That doesn't mean as parents, we're not supposed to supervise and guide our children's experiences, but we still have to play the energy game, no matter how much emotion and love we have for our children. I mean, we don't have to, but the more we can stay conscious and intentional about our interactions, as opposed to letting our powerful emotions dictate our choices, the better off our kids are going to be. Because we end up doing more harm than good by overparenting and projecting onto them. And one thing is for sure with every parent, no matter where they fall on the spectrum, that our limitations, whatever we have not resolved personally in our own lives, they're going to show up when we parent. It's inevitable. You know, if we have unresolved anger, sadness, inadequacy or fear of failure or we feel we failed we're going to impose that in various ways on our children it's going to express itself all the more reason to stay awake and present with how we parent to just do the very best to not allow our negativity if you want to use that word onto them and here's another way to look at it when we highlight our children's connection to the divine and teach them how to be in the flow of life, it will inspire them to become successful and independent more than our good intention controlling behavior, making them do things. Not that sometimes we don't have to enforce a boundary, but if we take the other approach, then those enforcing moments are gonna be few and far between because people want to feel confident people want to become independent i don't care what age you are they want to become accomplished and if we guide them in that process giving them the opportunity to do that for themselves they're going to do it we don't have to worry about some other outcome you know and sometimes it's a really good thing when our children don't get what they want or get the best position on the team or the lead in the play these are life lessons that allow our children to develop from their own wisdom and experience and learn how to cope with the inevitable losses that life gives to all of us. And in these lessons, when we guide our, our children appropriately, they're going to begin to define themselves in a positive way, not see themselves in a lesser way. Overall, our children's lives are their journeys and their opportunities to be stars in their own life. And our job as a parent is to provide the space for them to do that. You know, I've been to many sporting events for both my son and daughter, and I have watched parents get really worked up over what happens on the field. And it's, it's really sad to me because it's it's a child's game it's not the mlb or you know dancing with the stars it's supposed to be for kids to have some fun and learn about themselves you know it's like oh we're at the world series and everything's on the line you know it's it's kind of gross to me but i've watched divorced parents acting badly in front of their children using them against the other parent i watch this acting out and realize that 
many people do not have an idea of balance and acting in a child's best interest. We assume that people know this if we've had good models. You know, but the energies these parents throw around and are consuming in front of their children are flat out toxic. And they are unintentionally, most often, creating karma upon karma and delaying the very feelings they want to experience in their own lives and giving their children a legacy of confusion and complexity that they will have to unpack in their adult life. So as with all relationships, we're dealing with many sets of energies that people didn't have to contend with even 100 years ago. You know, most of us don't even think about the fact that even 60 years ago, we didn't have birth control. You know, but we've gone from procreation as a normal and typical way to approach adulthood, including religious programming about it, to a time in history when men and women have true choice about the direction of their life. And in addition to gender equality and those changes, we're living in a time when the planet is so populated, some experts contend we can't support the life we have right now. You know, this includes the resource distribution, which is something that requires all of our attention. You know, these are considerations that didn't exist 200 years ago. But in the span of our known history, until the last 200 years, conditions have accelerated in such a way on the planet that when people choose to parent, a whole host of considerations come into the equation that weren't there before. So let's look at this story with Susan. Susan is a brilliant and sensitive woman who was married to a doctor and worked uh, at an administrative position. She called me after reading a book review in a local newspaper. She had been struggling with infertility for some time. She was scared and looking for answers. In her world, nothing was giving her peace or making her feel better about her now. She was quite upset and worried about her ability to become pregnant and stay pregnant. She and her husband had already spent enormous amounts of money on in vitro fertilization and other costly procreation procedures. So Susan's first question to me was, am I cursed? And she followed that with, did I do something in a past life that is causing me to have this experience? Well, let me address the first questions. Because in the, in the three plus decades I've been doing this work, I've never seen any evidence that such a thing as a curse exists. Is there karma to be resolved? Yes. Can energy attract to itself? Absolutely. Can conditions create themselves in such a way that we find ourselves on a repeating cycle, having unpleasant experiences over and over? Yes, yes, and yes. But these are not curses. You know, just as with any relationship, if we allow ourselves and we embrace victimhood, we will be that, that we have to aspire always, no matter what hand is dealt to us, to a higher wisdom, and that that's the route, that's the path. You know, if an individual has the capacity to take advantage of another, if conditions are ripe, they will. But everything I know about how energy works and how karma develops and resolves supports the idea that we either consent or reject energy. If we consent to the idea that curses are real and that we do not have autonomy over any energy, we create that reality. So I explained the curse karma idea to Susan. Then I did actually look at her past life energy and I saw she had more than one lifetime where she was quite self-absorbed. When she had children, she didn't do a very good job of taking care of them. So she created a karma for herself that would make it a bit more difficult to get her hands on children again, especially the ones she had in lifetimes before. And that goes to the point that we do reincarnate with people we know and have been with before. They're not strangers to us. So if someone doesn't treat me well, I'm going to think twice before I go hang out with them. 
Why would I put myself in a situation that's going to be unpleasant? And the same is true energetically. Some of it's conscious and some of it isn't. Well, Susan was really on a path to learn appreciation. Her pregnancy difficulties were causing her to look at her life differently. So even though in real time she was in pain and her self-worth was plummeting, it was also an expansive time for her. There's two sides to that coin. So as we continued our dialogue, Susan expressed a lot of guilt for spending her husband's money. She felt responsible for putting them through the emotional exhaustion of trying to become pregnant or becoming pregnant and being unable to maintain it. But when she did become pregnant, she would miscarry. So they would be back to square one. She was also feeling inadequate as a woman because she couldn't conceive and carry a child to term. She was also becoming embarrassed about it. She was nearly 40 and hearing the, the pounding of her biological clock tick. When I asked about the possibility of adoption or surrogacy, she indicated her husband was not on board with those options. She was locked into pregnancy as her only route to parenting. She was scared. Susan's husband considered adoption a less than circumstance. And if he chose adoption, then he was less than two. So this idea of becoming a parent through pregnancy is a declaration of a value in life. It is a core cultural belief, sometimes physiological, that many people in Western culture possess. Pregnancy is somehow a representation of our virility, our masculinity, or our femininity. But when we allow this type of programming to shape our decisions, we limit not only our ability to receive, but we project erroneous concepts onto our unborn child who will someday be born and carry on those frequencies. So I worked with Susan to help her separate from the programming about her self-worth. We had to talk about that idea that if she didn't have a baby, she was less than a woman. We covered a good distance with that. Just giving her permission to have a purpose beyond procreation was an empowering concept. I explained to her that energetically, there is no way to fail in this scenario. She will be fulfilled no matter what or whether she parents or not. If a woman does not parent, she will not be fulfilled is one of the fallacies running rampant on the planet. So these are three categories I often see women fall into energetically, and they are these. One, a woman absolutely must parent. The karmic agreements here are so strong. The woman is going to be a parent someday. And often this individual has children early in life and has several children. Two, the woman may parent one day down the road after other aspirations have been met. But this person is an option parent. It means they recognize their fulfillment does not have to come through parenting, but still may want the experience, or they simply postpone parenting. Often these women have just one child, maybe two. And the last common scenario, number three, is the woman will not parent. These women know early that parenting is not extremely appealing to them, and they may or may not express it. They keep it to themselves. They can be pressured overtly and covertly to consent to parenting, but ultimately they do not. And the good news is that if you're meant to parent and it is important for your spiritual, karmic, and emotional development, you will have a child. It will happen. If it is not important to your spiritual, karmic, and emotional development, it won't happen. Just like all life purpose events, we can't get away from them. They will find us. So women can relax around the idea of pro procreation. If we don't parent, it's going to be okay. Our lives will still be full. You're still a good person. And now more than ever at this time in history, women can find incredible fulfillment through the contributions they make, just as men have done for thousands upon thousands upon thousands of years. There are plenty of children on the planet who need care if we want to be that person for a child. With Susan, I encountered something that I see from time to time, which is 
People do not want to be disloyal to the tribe they are in. They would rather participate in low level frequency identifications and expand into a higher level identification. What that means is they're not ready for the implications of expanding beyond what the tribe says is our value system. And if they do, and they do step outside of the tribe's value system, sometimes those relationships won't survive. And a survival instinct will only take them so far in their expansion. Susan could only go as far as to get some relief, but not all the way to claim a new perspective. She was comparing herself to her other female friends who already had children, and she was feeling left out as if she was failing in her life and as a woman. So her answer was to find a way to get pregnant and stay pregnant. And that's fine. There's no issue with that. You know, we all have, there's a physiological component to this. We're hardwired to procreate to sustain the species, but we are more than animals. We all have incarnated at this time in history to help elevate consciousness in a very rapid manner, to keep pace with the rapid changes going on on the planet. It all has to evolve at the same time if we want to survive. And when we consider how rapidly modern life has expanded since the Industrial Revolution, we have a lot of emotional and spiritual catch up to do to bring balance to this planet. Susan and I worked together for a period of time and eventually she did become pregnant and have a baby and she was thrilled and excited to be a mom. And after all the struggle, her fears and doubts were quieted. With Susan, as with all people, if we do not want to project our personal karma and challenges onto our children, before we ever choose to parent, I encourage people to consider these questions. One, why do I want to become a parent? Two, what do I think it will give me and do for me? Three, what are my expectations for my child? Four, do I believe my child has a job to do for me? Five, am I becoming a parent because I want to or because I'm keeping up with what I think I'm supposed to do? Six, is parenting my dream or someone else's dream? Seven, what does it mean about my masculinity or my femininity if I choose not to parent? Eight, do I believe I can put the needs of someone else before me all the time for 18 years at least? These are important questions because underneath many of them lie our beliefs about parenting, self-worth, and the programming from our culture and our peers. If we don't take the time to examine these beliefs, we go into a creative process unconsciously. And most people agree that babies are cute. They see parents playing at a park or having fun with a child and they think these moments are all there is. However, it is a long-term commitment that is full of unexpected twists and turns and it's physically challenging, emotionally challenging and draining. And there are real impediments to your own life progressing that come forward as your child develops. Parenting is full of feelings we cannot anticipate. And until you become a parent and are smack dab in the middle of the process, you cannot understand how you will feel or what it takes to manage its impact in your life. So another client, Genevieve, came to me several years ago dealing with low self-worth. Again, a 40-something woman with a young daughter, a professional woman, and truly one of the kindest people I have ever met. She was raised by seven brothers and sisters as her parents were always working to support that large family. Her siblings, being children themselves, were fiercely competitive with one another. And they essentially raised her but they raised her with the limitation of a child's perspective. Throughout her childhood, she was alone a lot of the time, 
and she had to figure out ways to amuse herself and keep herself company. In childhood, she developed a weight problem for which her siblings harassed her unrelentingly. And another factor was that the boys in her family received more help than she did. Several were put through college, but Genevieve had to earn her own way through college, which speaks to, of course, her determination to succeed in life. But when she first came to me, she had a pattern of allowing people to take advantage of her both professionally and personally. She believed she had to always go above and beyond for people to earn their attention, their respect, and yes, their love. She would never go against the family code or belief system. In one example, she purchased a four bedroom home for herself and her daughter. Several of her family members felt entitled to move in and Genevieve was unable to say no. And none of them contributed financially and the financial burden of these family members moving into her property caused her to lose the property. In the workplace, managers and coworkers were constantly requiring that she work excessive hours. It was not unusual for her to work from 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. or later at night. And often her daughter would be in a conference room at her workplace doing homework or playing on an iPad while Genevieve worked. And although she was educated and a trained professional in a position of authority, she often found people calling her judgment into question. And the only way she could rescue herself from these positions was to find other jobs. She was unable to stand up for herself, let alone defend herself or voice her opinion. She felt she had to take whatever was dished out to her, and she had no sense of boundaries whatsoever. We began our work together and talking about what healthy boundaries look like and what is appropriate and inappropriate in the workplace or in personal relationships. And it seemed to have some impact on her professional success. She began to command more authority in her roles you know, a self-described fly under the radar type of person, she began to recognize that speaking up was as much a necessity in her job description as it was to execute her other job tasks. Throughout the course of our work together, I would often ask Genevieve if she thought about having a relationship. And the only relationship she had ever had was with her daughter's father, and it ended badly. And her response was, I'd like one, but I'm too fat and don't feel good about trying to find someone who would be interested in me. Besides, I have my daughter. So she believed she and her daughter would be together forever. She had already predetermined her daughter's role in her life. Rather than develop the skill to fill herself up, she was requiring and expecting that her daughter fill her up. So although Genevieve loved her daughter very much, unconsciously she was using her. All the nights that Genevieve spent at the office until 9 p.m. feeding her daughter takeout and placing her in the conference room alone was setting her up to have the same life she had. She did not learn how to interact socially, how to stand up for herself or have a voice or defend herself if necessary. Her daughter was spending all her evenings alone in a conference room while her mother worked. Several times when we had appointments, her daughter would come and sit in the waiting area. She was available when Genevieve wanted her to be available, but her daughter's needs were secondary. Genevieve made sure her daughter went to a great school. She was always fed and clothed and had opportunities placed before her. But what was lacking was true connection. Even though she wanted to, Genevieve could barely make room in her life for her daughter. And at the end of the day, that's what children need the most from us. They need our time, they need our attention, they need our safety. And then we move into the modeling of how to be successful in life and get what you want. Granted, being a single mom is one of the most difficult and thankless jobs on the planet. You are the provider of everything love, nurturing, play dates, money. And Genevieve had more than adequate resources, but what she didn't have was a lot of self-worth. And she allowed others to bully her at the expense of her daughter and their relationship. She allowed a fear-based and scarcity consciousness to make her decisions. 
And so in that scarcity consciousness are layers and layers of internal dialogue and beliefs that told her there was no other way, that this is the only way to behave. Well, one day came and she had an appointment and she was particularly distressed this day about her relationship with her daughter. She was visibly upset as she and her daughter had been arguing and it had been going on for a period of time and it had now escalated to a full on power struggle. Apparently at one point out of frustration, Genevieve slapped her daughter. She felt completely out of control and did not know what to do. Her daughter was becoming verbally aggressive with her and she was becoming defiant and argumentative, didn't want to do her homework or anything else her mother asked. Overall, she was becoming resistant to her mother. And this was absolutely terrifying to Genevieve. Suddenly, she was faced with a reality that her daughter may not always be there to love and support her in her life. And this is a classic mistake some parents make. I'm going to have children and they will take care of me in my old age. We don't know that. And we don't have the right to project that onto our children, but many of us do. You know, if we are loving and attentive to our children, the chances are they're going to want to take care of us. We have modeled good care to them. But if we put them in a room with a big bag of food and pay them no attention, that's not a demonstration of connected love. Yes, their need for food and water has been met, but their need for love, connection, and nurturing has not. Genevieve, through her own pattern of self-abandonment, regularly abandoned her daughter, causing her daughter to repeat a version of the experience Genevieve had in childhood. Well, often because of Genevieve's schedule, she and her daughter ate a lot of fast food and didn't get time to move their bodies much. And her daughter began to develop a weight problem, just as Genevieve had. And now Genevieve's daughter was pushing back on the routine and the life Genevieve had created for them. And being smart and a willing spirit, she decided it was time to roll up her sleeves and get to work on the business of filling herself up and deepening her approach toward her interaction with her daughter. I recommended that Genevieve and her daughter go to a therapist and they began to do some deeper work around the patterns in their life. They were able to come to new understandings about how they wanted to progress as a family. Genevieve began a course of work in NLP, neuro linguistic programming, to target her low self worth and claimed a new dedication to learning to love herself unconditionally. As I mentioned before, when we become a parent, anything we have not resolved in our own life will show up in how we parent our children. Our flaws will reveal themselves. That is the beauty and the catastrophe of parenting. And the opposite is true. The positive things that we have developed will also reflect in our children. And parenting, like all relationships, are mechanisms for growth. We can use the experience to heal and expand ourselves, or we can contract and refuse to acknowledge our limited belief systems. Children, as baby beings, choose us as parents. They have agreements with us to grow as well. Often baby beings have stronger agreements with one parent than another, and as with Genevieve, there was a dual agreement between the two of them to help each other heal. And although Genevieve pro projected a lot of responsibility onto her child, on some level spiritually, her daughter agreed to be in that role. Eventually, she was the catalyst for Genevieve to reach for her self-love with determination. And from a different perspective, her daughter was responsible for Genevieve's shift to focus. This example with Genevieve and her daughter represents the beauty and synchronicity of how consciousness affects love in the human experience. We see hardship and trials as bad things. At the end of the cycle, Genevieve is on a path to self-love, which reinforces my point that we can't be given an experience we don't need in our evolutionary path. 
you know, and her daughter, who she has known before, consented to come to this planet and help her with this issue. If that is not love, I don't know how else one would define it. When we know we're stepping into the lion's den and we still choose to do it because it's in the best interest of the individual and the collective, that's about a potent statement about the power of love and consciousness there is from my point of view. Love is strong, unrelenting, courageous, and determined. And energetically, when we match the characteristics of love, we become love and we attract love and loving experiences into our life. Our life will reflect a loving existence where love always finds us, rescues us, and brings us to our wholeness and true nature. It's beautiful. Like all relationships, even with parenting, we can choose to heal or come and come closer or we can resist and contract. We make these agreements spiritually with our parents and our children with us before we ever incarnate into this experience. But the more we separate from programming and allow ourselves to be guided by inner navigation, what I mean by what feels right to us, not what we're compelled to do by limiting beliefs, we can choose to parent or anything else from a place of abundance. When we approach our relationships from the choice to heal and expand rather than contract, we complete agreements with family members rather than continue or create new karma to resolve. And we know we've completed agreements when there's no longer charge upon the person or the situation. And the word charge means emotional content other than peace. When we bring all the other frequencies into a benevolent place, a higher vibration, we're complete, we're done. There is no reason to repeat a relationship, a situation, or a specific reoccurring dynamic. However, if we only consider present time, most of us can see that when we don't learn a lesson of the heart, we keep creating experiences to cause us to look at that lesson over and over again, Groundhog Day. And I have story upon story of clients who have come to me saying, I keep choosing the same partner over and over. I keep taking jobs where people don't value me. Well, in the continuum of life, time is not relevant. Balance is relevant. It's all about whether or not you can expand low level frequencies into high level frequencies. That may sound antiseptic, but when you do that, you become more expanded, your perspective shifts, your awareness becomes greater. And when we're in an expanded state, contracted vibrations can't exist. You know, once the light is turned on, darkness goes away. <laughs>